Do you want to stay in school? To do what? Do you want to stay in that? Join the new one. Uh huh. Yeah, join the new new meeting. And what we're going to do is get started with our chapter one stuff. So in Canvas, get it over here. Oops, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Not. Okay, I think I am down. And you guys just yell at me if I'm not, because I do that often. So in our modules, if you go to lesson one, the first part, the syllabus and our introduction, we're in pretty good shape on that. Don't forget to turn in your introduction PowerPoint. So even though you presented it in class, I do want you to turn it into Canvas. That way I can look at them um, and try to make a cahoots, or I can sneak back and try to remember things about people later. Now, if you don't know how to submit, there's instructions and links to videos in the assignment. You can look at that later. But let's go ahead and we're going to get started. Oh, thank you, sir. We're going to get started um, with. Chapter one. Let me find our class. I'm in the wrong class. I switched while we were breaking and forgot. OK, so in our modules. Again, we've got all of this stuff done. For our introduction, you should be looking at the review questions at home, getting your syllabus quiz done. But for the review questions, it's good if we have a little bit of information about chapter one. So I'm going to be looking at this lesson one PowerPoint, the instructor PowerPoint, the one that's indented the most. The other two are the PowerPoints from our textbook. There is a chapter zero in our textbook that talks about the history of computers and has some really interesting things if you want to look at that. But we really are starting with chapter one. So you can use that presentation if you like to kind of guide you through the chapter or you can just not worry about it. But I'm going to open this chapter one instructor PowerPoint. I'm going to download it. I don't have a lot of animations or anything, but it just works better. If I run it in PowerPoint. Canvas will work fine. So for chapter one, we're talking about basic programming concepts and things that people have to do when they begin programming. And computers were invented from the very early days to solve problems, right? What were they invented for? To do math. Everybody hates doing math. And so from the very early days of the 14 or 1500s, they were trying to figure out a way to automate that. And so that's where our computers come from is this overwhelming desire to get away from having to do math problems manually. And that's why computers do that so well, right? But we also use them to solve other problems. So it's good for us to look at general problem solving strategies and think about, think about that. So if we have a problem at hand that we wanna solve, the first step is for us to get a complete understanding of the problem. One problem that I like to use an example in our class is traffic in Springfield, right? It's great now, right? There's never any problems with yeah, traffic in never. Springfield. <laughs> well, let me tell you, it's a lot better than it used to be. <laughs> and when I was younger, you could be stuck at the intersection of Glenstone and Sunshine for like 40 minutes before you could get through and it was just ridiculous and it was to the point where insurance rates for car insurance were astronomical in Springfield because it was such a bad place to drive that there were more wrecks and so you actually had to pay more so it was a big problem lots of people like my brother my brother is a city planner so it drove him crazy 
And he would say things like, why in the world don't they have two left turn lanes here? Why is there only one? Or why is there no right turn lane? And the city and the engineers started looking at those problems and they started thinking of ways to solve some of the traffic issues. They started devising plans, right? Because we can't solve a problem unless we have a plan of action. So one of their early solutions to the traffic problem was let's try to build two left turn lanes at some of these really busy intersections so that people can get through them faster. Well, now they had to communicate that with a lot of people, right? Have you ever, have you, have you guys seen all of the uproar about the Springfield flag? There's a lot of people in this town that are just negative. They just don't like anything to change. And they had to convince all those people that it was worth all this mess and all this expense to build two left turn lanes. They were like, you know, city council, we really need to do this. We need the money and all that. And so they did all of that communicating with the stakeholders, the other people that were involved. Who all was involved? Well, all the citizens of Springfield, all the citizens of all these little towns that come to Springfield all the time to make the traffic worse. The police department, the city council, a lot of different stakeholders had to be convinced that the changes were worthy. So they got them convinced and they executed the plan. They put in some two lane left turn lanes, but then they had to review the results. They can't just sit back being all fat and happy and say, that was great, it worked awesome. They have to really monitor their traffic situation to see if it really solved the problem. And then we can start over again, trying to make things even better. But we always have to review our results and make sure that the plan worked. The one I love in Springfield for our problem solving with our traffic are the diverging diamonds, right? Do you like those? My sister won't drive on them. She would stop and cause a wreck if she was coming up on one because she hates them so bad. But you know, those were developed in Springfield because of our terrible traffic problem. And the engineers, the planning people that came up with those ideas received a lot of awards and things for how great those diverging diamonds work. That's why we see them all over the place now, kind of like a roundabout. So that's our problem solving methodology. We can think about problems that we're gonna solve with the computer, or we could think about problems with traffic, or we could think about medical problems, no matter what, we always just follow these same steps to solve problems. So when we are coming up with a solution, a lot of times we need to make like step-by-step -step instructions to tell people how to do whatever it is we're trying to do. So whenever we make step-by-step -step instructions like that, we, can, we call it an algorithm. So here's an algorithm that I have. This is how to get to my neighborhood. This is my mapping algorithm. I leave OTC heading south on Sherman and I turn left on traffic way. Traffic way goes under Glenstone instead of across it. So that saves me a lot of time because I don't have to sit at a stoplight. Then I merge onto Chestnut Expressway, turn right on Barnes and turn left on Cherry. That's how I get to my neighborhood. Question, is that the only way I could get from here to there? No, there's lots of other ways, right? I could go in circles and waste all sorts of time, but I would eventually get there. It's just one way. So it's an algorithm because it is one way that works, but it's not the only possible solution. It's just the one that I came up with and the one that I like. Now, what about if I put things in a different order? What if I said to turn left on traffic way, way down here? Would that work? No, I'd be lost, right? It'd be like Google Maps sometimes when you get off in the wrong place. So the order matters, right? When I'm creating my org algorithm, I'm gonna have a list of step-by-step -step instructions that are in the right order. So might not be the only solution, but it is a solution that's in the correct order. So that's what programming is. Programming is just a list of instructions. The instructions are executed by a computer to try to accomplish some sort of task. And when we create those instructions, we're programming. 
Now we have a problem. You guys have seen it. Not everybody can do it. It's kind of technical. So there's not everybody involved. I have this video attached. I'm going to kind of scan through it a little bit instead of watching the whole thing. It's getting a little bit old. But let's see. I was 13 when I first got access to uh, a computer. My parents bought me a, uh, a Macintosh in 1984 when I was eight years old. I was in sixth grade. I learned to code in college. Freshman year, first semester, um, intro to computer science. I wrote a program to play tic-tac-toe. I think it was pretty humble beginnings. I think the first program I wrote asked uh, things like, what's your favorite color? Or how old are you? I first learned how to make a green circle and a red square appear on the screen. The first time I actually had something come up and say, hello world, I, did the, I made a computer do that. It was just astonishing. Learning how to program didn't start off as wanting to learn all of computer science or, um, or trying to master this discipline or anything like that. It just started off because I wanted to do this one simple thing. I wanted to make something that was fun for myself and, and my sisters. And I wrote this little program and then basically just add a little bit to it. And then when I get to learn something new, I looked it up either in a book or on the internet and then added a little bit to it. It's really not unlike kind of playing an instrument or something or, 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 you know, or playing sport. <laughs> It starts out being very intimidating, but you kind of get the hang of it over time. Coding is something that can be learned, and um, I know it can be intimidating, and a lot of things are intimidating, but, uh, you know, what isn't? A lot of the coding that people do is actually fairly simple. Um, it's, it's more about the process of breaking down problems than, uh, you know, sort of coming up with complicated algorithms as people traditionally think about it. You don't have to be a genius to know how to code. You need to be determined. Addition, subtraction, uh, that, that's about it. You should probably know your multiplication tables. <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to code. Do you have to be a genius to read? Even if you want to become a race car driver or play baseball um, or, uh, you know, build a house. And it, all of these things have been turned upside down by software. What it is is, you know, computers are, are everywhere. You want to work in agriculture? Uh, fast forward just a bit. Some cool stuff here. Past Will. I want to show ya. Just aren't enough people who are trained and have these skills today. To get the very best people, we try to make the office as awesome as possible. So this is Steam headquarters. all these kind of interesting things uh, around the office and places where people can play or relax um, or go to think or play music or be creative. Whether you're trying to make a lot of money or whether you just want to change the world, computer programming is an incredibly empowering skill to learn. I think if someone had told me that software is really about humanity, that it's really about helping people by using computer technology, it would have changed my outlook a lot earlier. To be able to actually come up with an idea and then see it in your hands and then be able to press a button and have it be in millions of people's hands, uh, I mean, I, I think we're the first generation in the world that's really ever had that kind of experience. Just to think that I mean, you can start something in in your college dorm room and you can have a set of people who haven't built a big company before come together and build something that a billion people use as part of their, their daily lives is, is just crazy to think about, right? It's really, it's humbling and it's amazing. The programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You know, you're going to look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. For sure. Okay, I'm going to skip kind of to the end. This video was created by code.org in like 2013, so it is getting old now, but it's still very applicable. I like showing the um, part where they show the steam facilities. And of course, people are working from home right now with remote situations. 
but the companies keep trying to get them back, right? Because if you looked at all of those people that they showed at STEAM headquarters, very few of them were alone. They were almost always talking something out with somebody else. It's an important thing for us to do as programmers to get our thoughts out. Now, why doesn't everybody do it? That's the big question. Because it's not that easy, right? So as you guys are learning programming and going through your different classes, there's definitely going to be times where things are challenging for you. And you have to take a deep breath and do your best and keep moving forward. Because remember, none of the people in this video are perfect. None of them knew everything before they started. They just started and keep trying, and that's important. Now, the lunchroom there at Valve was really cool. And if you notice, they said everybody eats free. And I want to tell you guys about a guy from Southwest Missouri who grew up outside of Joplin, not too far from you guys. He was homeschooled. He decided he wanted to be an iPhone developer, and that became his goal. He, his dad had a cabinet making studio, so his dad worked with wood, and you know, those were the things the family was used to. They weren't like tech people at all. But Derek wanted to learn about computers and programming, so he convinced his parents that he needed to go to school, and he came to the, the tech center where I worked to take my classes. He worked really hard with his dad to make extra money so he could buy a Mac because he wanted to do iPhone programming and he knew he needed a Mac. So he got that. He took the programming little intro class that I had and he took that and he turned that into an internship at Apple. That was one of his goals. Besides having the actual internship at Apple, he had just gotten married. Him and his wife were flown out to Cupertino. They had a fancy apartment on the ocean front. He went to work at Apple headquarters every day. His wife didn't really have a lot to do because they had just got married and she was out there with him. So every day she was really good about making him a lunch and sending him with his brown paper bag to work at Apple. Well, Derek is that kind of guy. He impressed everybody because he was just always smiling and always interested in things, not super intelligent, but just really easy to work with. And so everybody liked him at Apple. Of course, he did get a, a job offer and he turned it down because he wanted to come back to the Joplin area. So he didn't stay out there. His wife didn't like California. But the funny part was he said the very last day he was there as an intern, the guys were like, why don't you come with us to the lunch room, to the cafeteria? You never go eat lunch. And he said, well, my wife makes me my lunch. And they said, well, come with us today and see what's down here. And he said it was amazing that it just went on and on for miles. And he said, well, you guys, I'm glad I've never came down here because I would have just spent too much money with all this food. And they said, Derek, everything is free. So the whole time he was there, he had been bringing his sack lunch and he could have been eating in the big fancy cafeteria for free. He ended up in Joplin starting his own company. He, um, one of his clients was Nick Jonas. And Nick Jonas had an idea for a video game platform. So Derek and a couple other former students created a game. And Nick Jonas did his publicity thing of this ad campaign about the game. And indeed, he was able to make it be number one on the Apple Store platform for over a week. Now, Derek doesn't still do a lot of game stuff. But he still has a very successful web design company where Nick Jonas and IBM and some other really, really big name people are his clients. As a matter of fact, he was looking to hire somebody last year. And when I showed people his website, I think there were some people that thought that it was like made up, that it was fake, you know, that he couldn't really have those clients. But he does. And the thing I like to tell this story for is to remind you that he's not that much different than you. He just came up with a goal and he decided to pursue it and he was able to. And that's how things are for you guys. This field is wide open right now with being able to work remote. You can apply for jobs in Springfield, but you can just as easily apply for jobs in Colorado and California and all over the country, maybe even all over the world 
because they're allowing people to work remotely. So you have all these opportunities. Don't limit yourself by thinking that something isn't possible. Because I saw with Derek that, man, things are really possible. I didn't think that he would ever be an actual intern at Apple, but he was, and he made a lot of money, and it was a great experience. Now, getting back to our textbook, program development, we have the same kind of cycle in developing software as there is in general problem solving. First of all, we have to analyze the problem. Then we design some sort of solution. Usually we're doing this like not physically on paper, but using documents, you know, writing down our algorithms, writing down important notes so that we've got all of this information ready. Once we've done our design, we start coding. When we're coding then, and after coding, we're gonna be testing. You might have been a beta tester or something for some game, so you're familiar with the way the cycle works. After the testing is completed, we might have some bugs that need to be fixed, some revisions, but then the cycle really starts all over again. And you guys see this all the time with different releases, like with Windows, you know, as soon as they release Windows 10, they're starting to find out problems for it. They keep all those collected up together, come up with solutions, and then we see Windows 11 come out. Same with different releases of games. So this cycle is just never ending. As soon as we get done with something, we start looking at the, another problem or another situation that we can help with. So that's what the program development cycle is. So when we're working with designing a application, we might not even know what programming language we're going to use. So in our design phase, we try to use non-programming tools to document what we want the system to do. One thing that we use a lot is pseudocode. And pseudocode is just kind of like an English-like plan. It's like a list of our algorithm steps. It, there's not super specific rules for it. It's just kind of a general language of saying, this is what our program needs to do, whatever language it's in. So here's some pseudocode. This pseudocode <coughs> I just found on Google. It's for making a cup of tea, and it's pretty English. It says you have to organize everything together, plug in your kettle, put the tea bag in a cup, put water into the kettle, wait for the kettle to boil, add the water to the cup, remove the tea bag with a spoon or fork, add milk or sugar, and serve. So with these instructions, you could make some tea, right? I don't make a lot of tea, but I think I could with these instructions. So this pseudocode does exactly what it's supposed to. It documents the steps in this algorithm that defines how to make tea. Now, when I look at this, I think, hmm, what if the person doesn't want milk or sugar? Shouldn't we ask? So maybe we should have a spot there where this program requires input. It says, would you like cream or would you like sugar? Or how many sugars would you like? So when we have input like that, we call that question that asks for the input a prompt. So a prompt is when a program is asking you a question. So if you're on a website and it's asking you for your first name, that's a prompt. It's saying, what is your first name? Giving you information to know what data it needs. Now, when we type stuff in for that prompt, the program needs to save whatever we entered. We're going to save that information in a variable. And a variable is just a named location in memory. So if we asked how many sugars, we could save the answer from our user in a variable. What would be a good name for our variable that holds how many sugars they want? Sugar, what else? Any other ideas? Sugar, sugar count? Yeah, sugar. That's a good one. No sugars. 
lots of different things we could come up with. And those are all great variable names because they describe what's going on, what that variable is holding. So we have some rules for variable names that apply pretty much to all programming languages. So here's our rules. First of all, a variable name has to be one word, so it can't have spaces, right? It's just one thing all smushed together. It can't start with a number. It should be meaningful, and we can have some long names, but in general, we like to keep it short, but meaningful. So here's some. Is this a valid variable name? Does it look good? Looks good to you? Can I have that underscore? Yep. What about this one? What's wrong with it? Space. So it's two variable names, right? Not one. What about this one? That looks good. It's good. How about that? Starts with a number. We can't do that. So that would be an invalid one. What about this name here? That would work, wouldn't it? People might want to kill us later because they don't know what in the world that variable is holding. It's not a very descriptive name, but it is valid. So we'll turn it yellow. It works, but it's not good. What about this one? Works, but it's not good. Exactly. Z is fine. I could use that as a variable name. And maybe in a certain situation, it does have enough meaning <laughs> to be a good variable name. Right, but in general, yeah, you know, it's questionable. What about this one? Space. How about that? Okay. How about that? Yes, but it's very long. <laughs> it's way too long, isn't it? Now, one thing to notice about this one, notice how since all the words are shoved together, each new word starts with an uppercase letter. That's called camel case. Camel case is where we have humps here in our word because we have uppercase letters to kind of point out to other people that that is the beginning of a new word. Now, this version here, where the first letter is also an uppercase letter, is upper camel case. We normally use lower camel case where the first letter would be a lower case letter and then we would have an uppercase one for each one after. And that's just what programmers have come up with over time that works well for variable names. We can have a lot of underscores and things, but they just take up unnecessary space. So using camel case is kind of a really good solution. Now, when we're working with variables, Sometimes we have a variable that holds data that doesn't change. Like, like maybe we need to use the value of pi in a formula. We could set up a variable named pi and give it the value. And then in our code, we would be referring to that variable. Whenever we have a variable like that with an unchanging value, that's called a constant because it has a constant value. In our area, we could say that the area code is a constant, but then if we were moving outside of our area, it wouldn't be. So whether something is constant or not could be relative to the situation. Here's some pseudocode that they present in our book. The very first one. Our book gets pretty specific about how they like their pseudocode formatted. I'll have some good rules, so we'll follow along with the way they like it. So this pseudocode only has two actions in our algorithm. First, we want to write a message out to the screen. That's our prompt. And our message is going to say, enter the number of songs you wish to purchase today. I can tell that that's what the message is going to say because all of those words are enclosed in double quotes. So those double quotes make it into one thing, one string of letters. So that's what would be written out to the screen. The right part is my command. 
write something to the screen and here's what I want to write. Now the cursor would be sitting here on the screen waiting for the user to type something. We're in a console type program, not a fancy graphical one right now. So we would need to input the data. In this example, our variable name is going to be songs. It's going to hold how many songs they want to purchase. Does that make sense? Get it, get it? So we want to do this fancy stuff. Now, when we're doing prompts like this, first we want to make sure that we know what our prompt is, and then our input statement that follows it is going to identify the name of the variable where we want to hold that data that was typed. Now, this prompt, if you notice, has a space after the colon. That's so when the user types, their answer won't be squished right up against the colon. So if we want there to be a space there, we have to include it. In this example, we are asking for two things to be input, enter two numbers. So since we want them to enter in two numbers, we're going to have two input statements. The first one, we'll read the first number into a variable called number one. The second input statement, we'll read the second number into a variable number two. So our pseudocode can get a little bit bigger now. Once we find out how many songs they want, we'd like to calculate how much money they're going to spend. Our songs cost 99 cents each. So we're going to do some math. In our pseudocode, we specify all of that using this command set. So that's not a real programming thing. It's just a pseudocode thing. <coughs> but what we're doing here is saying we have a variable named dollar price. We want to update its data. We want to set its data equal to 99 cents times the number of songs the user said they want. So do you see that happening there where we've got our math going on? We've got a, a literal value here of our 99 cents and we're going to multiply that by however many songs the user wants. And then we're going to write that answer, what that total price is, out to the screen. So notice how this is not really a certain programming language. It's just general pseudocode. It's just a design step where we're talking to people or we're looking at the current system and we're writing down what needs to happen in our new system. So our pseudocode, just like the algorithms, has to be in order. I couldn't have this input statement before I write out the prompt because that wouldn't make any sense. I would be asking the user to type something in without telling them what to type. So the order is important. I can't do this math until I know how many songs they want, right? So I have to have things in the right order. So what's going to happen when, if we theoretically were able to run this pseudocode on some system, our write statement would execute first, and we would see that message on the screen, enter the number of songs you wish to purchase today. We would input whatever they type into our songs variable. So let's say they type 74. They want 74 songs. So now our songs variable has a value of 74. The next thing we do is update our new variable dollar price, setting it equal to the result of this formula. So let's do that. We have a constant of 99 cents and our dollar price would be the two of those multiplied, which is $73.26. I have it done already because I wouldn't be able to do that math without a calculator. Then finally, we write that out to the screen. 
Now, when we write it out to the screen, I don't show that here. We would just be writing out this amount 7326. That set statement was called an assignment statement. An assignment statement is used when we want to give a value to a variable. So in this assignment statement, we're giving the variable number X the value of 45. So we have this variable in memory called number X and it has this value of 45. What about this one? What's our variable name that we're going to be updating? Number X. And what's the value it's going to hold? Now it'll be 97, right? So it will actually be 97. Good. Like I said earlier, we started with computers to do math. So our math operations are pretty important. We can do all sorts of different math operations. Our general ones are addition and subtraction, multiplication, division. If we want to do an exponent like a power, usually we use this caret character. Where's that caret character on your keyboard if you needed to type it? Yep, shift six. Exactly. And then another math kind of thing that we can do is the modulus command. The modulus command is indicated with a percent sign. And it's kind of interesting. What it does is division, but then it returns the remainder from the division. So in this example, if we divide 14 by 3, we don't care what the answer is. We care how much was left over, and it was 2. The modulus command is really handy because if I would have said 14 modulus 2, if I had a remainder, I would know the number was odd. If I didn't have a remainder, I would know the number is even. So we can use the modulus command for lots of things like that in determining the characteristics of a number. Is it even? Is it odd? Those kinds of things. Now, when we're doing math, we have an order of operations, just like when we're doing math by hand. The PEMDAS rules, if you've heard that memory aid, PEMDAS stands for please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Your math teacher might have had a different abbreviation, but basically that means that First, we do the things in parentheses. Then we do things that are powers, the exponentiation. Then we do multiplication. And the whole time, we're going left to right across the formula to decide what needs to be done next. Then we do division. Finally, we do addition. And subtraction has the lowest priority. It gets done last. So if we were looking at this awesome math problem, what would we want to do first? Now let me put it down here. What I can do is start repeating the formula. So the first thing I'd want to do are the things in parentheses, and I'm going to evaluate this from left to right. So I'm going to have three times eight, because I'm going to do the math in that parenthesis, divided by 12 plus, and then I'll go ahead and do seven minus five. So I'll put my two in there, to the power of two times three. Okay, so now I've got that formula where I have resolved these two things that are within the parentheses. So what would I do next? Exponent. So would I take 2 to the power of 2 or 12 plus 2 to the power of 2? I would just do this exponent part. So if I take that and simplify it a little bit more, 
I'm going to have 3 times 8 divided by 12 plus to the power of 2, which is 4 times 3. So I'm just going to have to keep doing each step. Now, what's the next thing that I would do? Multiplication or division? Which one comes first? Multiplication. So again, I'm going to be evaluating left to right. I'm going to say 3 times 8 is 24 divided by 12 plus 4 times 3 is 12. Okay, I'm getting it done. So I've got to do my division next. So that would give me 2 plus 12. And finally, I can come up with my answer of 14. In your textbook, in some of the review questions, you'll see some math like that. And this is how you want to do it. Step by step, simplifying as you go, doing the highest priority thing first. That makes sense? Questions? This is an area that can get a lot of people because depending on your level of math experience, it might seem really easy to you, or it might be something that you're really having a hard time struggling with the concepts. So that's okay. Just keep trying it, and then you can use a calculator to see if you got it right. So you can check yourself. But we often need to figure out what a formula is doing. Now, lastly, before we go, or actually we're going to look at our pseudocode before we go. Whenever we output from our songs program, we just popped out this number and we didn't tell the user anything about this number, like what it means or anything. So in order to make our output clearer, we like to annotate our output, like add a little bit of information or message to it. So in this example, instead of just writing out the variable, we're going to write out this string in double quotes, the cost of your purchase is, and then we're going to add in that value of that dollar price variable to the output message. When we have a plus sign like this, in a statement where we're using strings, we're adding something more to our output. It's called concatenation. Now we have a few more things to look at in there, but I want to look at our pseudocode before you guys go. So let me see if I can find Canvas here. <clears throat> go to your modules. And let's look at this lesson one lab, reorder the pseudocode. It's due next time we come, so you would have time in class next time to look at it. But let's try to, to do it now so that when you are at home, you can think about it. Here's the problem. We have these different statements, but they're not in the right order. So how could we put them in the right order? Now, one thing that I hadn't mentioned that matters for doing this is before we use variables, we have to declare them. So the pseudocode that we were looking at hadn't added that part in yet, but this one does. So if I have to declare variables before I can use them, those two declare statements should come first. So copy them and paste them down here to the correct order. I'm not going to do it because if I do it, I'll update everybody's assignment and you'll have the answer and that's no good. <laughs> and then think about what order the rest of that pseudocode should be in. When you're done, you can submit this assignment because you can submit it again if you decide to change it. So next week when we come back, first thing we'll do is check our pseudocode, make sure everybody's got it correct so that we can talk about it and think about any confusion that comes up. So when you've got this done,
go ahead and submit it and you're free to get out of here and I hope you have a great weekend.